talented, funny, beautiful. Appearing in over 60 short films between 1923 and 1926, including many comedic shorts for the Hal Roach Studios. She was a star on the rise. Audiences loved her. Then, she just vanished. What happened to Catherine Grant? Catherine May Grant came into this world on May 1st, 1904 in Los Angeles, California. Her father, John Edmund Grant, was born in Lancashire, England in 1877 and immigrated to North America with his parents as a small boy. They first settled in Chicago where his sister Jessie was born. Then the family picked up and moved northwest to Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, where they would live for a few years. His father finally decided Los Angeles would be the place to settle down, so off to California they went. When John was 22, he met and fell in love with Catherine's mother, Pennsylvania-born Anita Mae Whiteman. They would marry on April 20th, 1900. Just over a year later, they would have their first child, a son named Chester Lonzell, on August 23rd, 1901, Catherine's big brother. John would first try his hand out as a carpenter, but as the years went by, he would switch professions and became a jack of all trades. This would also mean no income between his career choices, and as a result, this caused friction in the marriage. In 1914, John left his family and eventually ended up in San Francisco, trying his hand out as an auto dealer, later bringing his son Chester to be with him. Catherine, only being 10 years old, stayed with her mother in Los Angeles. A young Catherine would attend LA school, and at a young age she would excel in drama classes and the arts. In fact, one of her classmates was Glenn Tryon, who later in the years to come would appear with Catherine in a Hal Roach comedy short. Catherine would also find another passion at a young age, dancing. This would later in life help her with her performances. In fact, she would study under Ernest Belcher, a choreographer who owned his own dance studio called the Celeste Studio of Dance in Los Angeles. Ernest had a couple famous daughters. Dancer Marge Champion, who would later become the dancing model for Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. He was also stepfather to actress Lena Basket. In 1917, Catherine's mother, Anita, filed for divorce. She finally wanted to be free. She asked the courts for a monthly sum of $50. In 2023 money, that would be worth $1,137. She wanted it as child support for Catherine. John was served, but never showed up in court. Many hearings later, and tired of waiting, in January of 1921, Anita was awarded full custody of Catherine and also was granted a judgment for divorce. But she would have to wait another year for it to be finalized. On September 14, 1921, John would die from cancer at the age of 43, so the divorce didn't have to go through. Anita, already dating a Fred W. Kerr, would end up marrying him a couple months later. According to an article in Moving Picture World magazine, in 1921, Catherine could be seen on the studio sets as a background extra and in dance sequences, so she was already starting to get experience in the film industry. Her mother also encouraged her to take up modeling, which seemed innocent enough at first. But then she was hired by a female agent for a photography studio who encouraged Catherine to pose nude for art studies photos to be used by artists. But this would later come back to haunt her and even threaten her career. When she turned 18 and on the suggestion of her mother, she entered the Miss Los Angeles pageant. 
with her golden blonde hair, striking blue eyes, and dimpled cheeks, set against what newspapers called a marvelous complexion, she came out on top and won the title. After winning, she went back to the studio lots, waiting to be chosen to be a background dancer or an extra, all the time wishing for her big break. Next, she would head out to Atlantic City for the Miss America pageant where she would compete with many other selected beauties across the USA. Painter Norman Rockwell, who was one of the judges, said in a later interview the judging panel was given no instructions on how to judge the pageant or how to select a winner, so it was complete chaos behind the scenes. Mary Catherine Campbell of Columbus, Ohio would walk away with the crown, while future Ziegfeld Folly Girl and actress Dorothy Knapp came in as runner-up. Mary Catherine Campbell is the only person in history to win the Miss America pageant twice, as she also won in 1923. Sadly, Catherine did not place. While strolling the shops in Atlantic City, it is reported that Catherine saw postcards for sale and to her shock, it was her posing in the nude for what she was told was for art studies only. Worried what this would do for her career aspirations, she tried to stop all sales, but unfortunately the agent lied to her, telling her she was signing a receipt of the photos being taken, when in fact it was a release form giving away all her rights to those photos. So basically there was nothing Catherine could do to fight it. According to a 1925 Photoplay article, when Catherine came back to California, Universal Studio finally gave her a part with Jack Hoxie in Westerns. It may have been a small part, but this eventually grabbed the attention of Hal Roach and he offered her small parts in his Little Rascal comedies, starting with her role as the maid in Saturday Morning. She would also appear as Mary's nursemaid in the comedy The Cobbler. Hal Roach saw something in Catherine and decided to team her up with one of his comedic stars, Stan Laurel, who was starring in many movie shorts for the studio at the time, long before he teamed up with Oliver Hardy. Their first movie together would be The Noon Whistle, where Catherine would appear as the beautiful secretary. Hal Roach, impressed with her performance, offered her a short-term contract. Soon afterwards, she would receive a disturbing and upsetting phone call. A man claimed he had prints of her nude photos and tried to blackmail her. He said he would send the photos to Hal Roach himself unless she paid for those photos to remain unseen. Rumor has it the man was a movie extra and that he bought the prints from S.H. Worshin, the distributor of the photographs. He recognized Catherine as a subject in those photos, as he knew her from the movie sets they were both working on. Catherine then reached out to a lawyer. The lawyer tried to charge fraud and extortion not only against the blackmailer, but also against the original photographers and the agent that initially hired her to pose. Catherine explained in court she thought she was signing a receipt for the photos, and that they were being taken, not for a release form. She was led to believe she was posing for artists to help them in their work, not for photos that would be distributed as vulgar material later. Then, this story just seems to disappear from the newspapers. What happened? Some believe she won her case, and then the blackmailer was either thrown in jail or silenced and that the photographers were sent a cease and desist order and possibly the original plates of the photographs were destroyed. Although I have seen one of these photographs and I will not post it here on this platform out of respect for Catherine. Others believe that the Hal Roach studio got involved, paid not only for the prints but for the originals to make it all go away. This theory is based on the fact it is highly unlikely at this time with her career just starting, Catherine could pay for a lawyer, and neither could her mother or stepfather. The truth may never be brought to light, but there is no doubt the studio was involved in some way or another, and that those photos just disappeared, never to trouble Catherine again.
With that mess out of the way and behind her, Catherine would appear in many more of the Stan Laurel comedies, such as Under Two Jags, Kill or Cure, and Oranges and Lemons. As 1923 was coming to a close, Catherine and Stan Laurel would appear together in over 16 movie shorts for the Hal Roach studio. Audiences loved Catherine, her beauty, her comedic timing, and her presence on the screen. Very impressed with her work so far, Hal Roach offered Catherine a two-year contract, and of course, she accepted. A contract offered to an actress was exciting, but some of the fine print could be downright insulting and even frightening. Most of the contracts at this time offered to actresses had a clause included that if they gained any weight while filming, they would immediately be fired. Some studios even extended this clause in their contract to their private life. Any noticeable weight gain, especially pointed out in the press, would mean a dismissal from the studio. Catherine, who was already known for dancing, was also known for her physical activities and her exercising. But after she signed this contract, she started to watch her weight more. Some even say she became a little bit obsessive. It is said a director shortly afterwards called her into his office and pointed out she could do with a little more exercise. Then an extra told her she was getting a little round in the face. This frightened Catherine. She started on fad diets. Her mother even reporting she would only have orange juice for breakfast, spinach for lunch, and tomatoes for dinner. Catherine was not alone. Many actresses fearful of losing their contracts turned to fad diets borderlining on starvation, extreme exercising, and even dangerous experimental pills. In December of 1923, Catherine was very pleased that she was chosen to be a judge at a dance contest in Santa Ana put on by a local LA newspaper. Before judging, she would do her own dance, which impressed the contestants. And believe it or not, the band accompanying her was called the Blues Brothers. After her success in the Stan Laurel comedies, Hal Roach decided it was time to team her up with yet another fan favorite, Charlie Chase. Their first movie together would be Seeing Nellie Home, released in July of 1924. Catherine would star in the role of Nellie. Hal Roach knew a good formula to sell movies, and having Catherine team up with Charlie Chase was yet another one of his successes. In 1924, they would appear in over eight shorts together. But in the background, Catherine was still continuing her fad diets and her exercising. In 1925, Hal Roach submitted Catherine to appear in a Good Figures article in Photoplay magazine. He decided to expand her roles outside of the Charlie Chase comedies. She would appear in a spat family comedy called Wild Papa, where she got the chance to play a new type of vamp. 25 Movie Picture World magazine said she almost stole the picture from her fellow players. In that same article, they mentioned she started her own dance school on set, and she had a good reputation for instruction. She could be seen teaching such pupils as Mary Cornman from the R Gang serials. In May of 1925, Hal Roach finally awarded Catherine with a five-year contract. But by now, the effects of what Catherine was not only doing to her body, but to her mind was becoming obvious with many around her, including some of her co-stars. In front of the camera, full of energy and a professional. But when those cameras stopped rolling, she became exhausted and sometimes even confused. A studio rep would later say it was around this time that Catherine crashed her car into a post when she fell asleep at the wheel. She managed to walk away uninjured to the nearest police station and reported it. Yet this seems to be another incident that the studio machine seemed to keep quiet and out of the papers. 
After the accident, the studio made her take a short break in between filming to deal with her health, covering it up with a toothache story. A while later, after she was over her toothache, Catherine returned to filming. It was then, on December 8th, Catherine parked her car outside a pharmacy and went in to pick up some items. When she came out and on the way back to her car, she was struck by a Ford vehicle driven by a teenage boy and knocked down. The driver didn't even stop to see if the actress was okay. In fact, he sped away and was never caught. Catherine, perhaps in shock, got up and stumbled to her car and tried to drive home. She became faint and very dizzy and managed to stop outside of a garage that was not too far away. The mechanic came out to see what she wanted and Catherine told him that she was very ill and needed help. She handed him a card with the number to the Halroth Studios and begged him to call them. The studio then contacted a Dr. Louis Felder who rushed to the garage. After seeing the condition Catherine was in, he loaded her into his car and drove her to the Hollywood Hospital where he ordered immediate x-rays. After an examination, she was found to have no broken bones but was battered and a bit bruised. She stayed in the hospital for several days, but she was not improving as she should. Her fad diets and extreme exercising left her mind and body weak. After finding out about the accident, the studios put in the newspapers that she was getting better and would be back to filming in a few weeks. However, this was not the case. Seeing Catherine was not improving at the hospital, Dr. Felder released her to go home, hoping that under the care of her mother, she would finally get better. A few weeks later and still not fully recovered, Catherine was starting to worry about her contract with the Hal Roach Studios and returned in the spring of 1926 to film. It was reported behind the scenes again she was exhausted and confused, but by her performances in front of the camera, you would never notice. She played Billy the Bride in What's the World Coming To? She also starred in Charlie My Boy and The Hug Bug, which she would play opposite of school friend and classmate Glenn Tryon. Her return was heralded in motion picture magazines and the newspapers. But as soon as she was done filming The Hug Bug, she seemed to vanish. A few weeks passed and no sign of Catherine in the public eye. The newspapers reached out to representatives from the Hal Roach Studios to get an update and to find out where she was. The studio said she was still recovering at home from the accident but was improving. They also made a statement that Catherine was released from her contract until she was well enough to return back to filming. Then a few more weeks passed and still no sign of Catherine. A story came out that her mother took her to the mountains for a vacation, hoping the fresh air would do her some good. Then in May, the truth came out. Two health officers were sent to a sanitarium called the Sylvan Lodge, which was located on 4408 Santa Monica Boulevard. Reports came out that the operator of the sanitarium and maternity ward, a Mrs. Donna Bell, did not have a license. Concerns about the management and operation of the facility came into question, especially when they found out the true identity of Mrs. Bell. Her real name was Mrs. Etta Perry Heal. She was a former wife of a Chicago millionaire and she had quite a history with the law. In 1922, she faced grand larceny and burglary charges when she posed as a maid so she could gain access to homes of the wealthy and rob them. Even though she had two maids herself, the newspaper said she just couldn't resist the urge. After getting caught and put on parole, her husband at the time paid over $75,000 to the victims. $1,306,169 in today's money. Her husband would eventually file for divorce. 
But next, she would try to kidnap her kids from her husband, who were left in his care. She would also continue her ways, posing as maids and stealing, writing bad checks, defrauding, and eventually was caught and charged with grand larceny. She was paroled by Judge Arthur Reeve and sent to what was called in the newspapers at the time a psychopathic department to be treated for mental incompetence. The newspapers also report while she was there, she tried to take an overdose of pills. But many believe this was another one of her cons so she could escape the facility. Now, either she recovered really fast or there was some kind of major corruption going on, as here she was just a few years later running an illegal sanitarium. And then they found out it was not just one she was running, it was two. While the health officers were conducting their investigation, they came across a nerve-shattered, manic, and very sickly young woman that was first identified as a Ruth Woods. It didn't take them long, however, to find out her true identity. It was Catherine. Through their interviews with residents and staff, they found out that Catherine tried to flee the sanitarium at least twice. Once, she got past the attendants and jumped into a car that was parked outside and took off. She only got about a mile down the road before she was caught and taken back to the facility. The discovery of Catherine, of course, hit the news, and she was quickly and secretly moved to the Rosemead Sanitarium, also operated by Mrs. Bell. Soon, Rosemead would also be under investigation, and so the decision was made to move Catherine back home to her mother. The newspapers were demanding an explanation from the Halrote studio, and they had to respond. The studio explained her condition was brought on by a strain she had placed upon herself by the fight to avoid gaining weight. They also explained that her doctor ordered her to be removed to a place where she would have absolute rest. And for that reason, the studio and her doctor chose Mrs. Bell's sanitarium, as Catherine could be placed there under an assumed name. Dr. Parkin, Catherine's new doctor, made a statement that she was now staying with her mother and under both their care, he had hopes they would restore her beauty and normality. But he also cautioned that her physical and nervous condition would make it hard for her to exert herself to recover her poise. Translation, she couldn't exercise so doubtful she would get her slim figure back. After the news of Catherine in the sanitarium spread, other publications brought to light the dangers of fad diets, experimental pills, and the pressures put on young women to stay thin. They highlighted that actresses had even more pressure put on them due to the quest for stardom and the clause in some of their contracts. There was extensive investigation done in a 1926 photoplay article titled Against Reducomania. I want to read a few snippets from this article as I think it's important to see what Catherine and other young ladies at the time were putting themselves through. Something that sadly continues to this day. There were 225 women in the psychopathic ward at my hospital last year, Dr. Menis Gregory, the head of Bellevue Hospital says, suffering from serious mental disorders caused by anxiety about their increasing weight. There are numerous women suffering from depression, melancholia, restlessness for the same reason. Another part of the article goes on to say, the quick road to slimness is the quick road to neurasthenia, hypothyroidism, Bright's disease, hysteria, heart palpitations, tuberculosis, colitis, and possible death. And they go on to report what Dr. William S. Sadler of the American Medical Association said about this. The drug method. The use of drugs for reducing purposes is decidedly dangerous. The long-continued use of saline cathartics, the use of thyroid preparations and other drugs designed to produce a loss in flesh should be looked upon as doubtful value and never should be undertaken without expert counsel and advice. The Purgative Regime The Purgative Regime 
can be productive only of evil, resulting in serious disturbances of the digestive canal and otherwise jeopardizing one's health and efficiency. And here is what the investigative reporter had to say. I found in Washington that there are about 75 nationally known pills, capsules, tablets, chewing gums, breads, etc. on the market advertised as reducers, as well as countless concoctions for external use and many nostrums that are here today and gone tomorrow. So this is an example of how companies, even back then, were taking women's insecurities and making a profit off of them, no matter what damage to their health their products may have caused. And yes, again, it still happens today. Although Catherine is front and center in this article, they do go on to mention another couple actresses that were struggling. Nita Naldi, the motion picture actress was sick for weeks after following a pineapple and lamb chop diet. They mention another actress, Betty Blythe, is in Europe trying to recover from the effects of another fad diet. The article was written and the investigation conducted by Miss Catherine Brody. And yet you never hear of the male actors of this time going through this, only the women. Did it have something to do with those stipulations in their contracts about weight? And it didn't help that back in those days, the cameras and the film did make you look like you were a couple more pounds than you were in real life. The article was a warning to young ladies out there. Don't look to Hollywood when trying to find body positivity. It can be dangerous and deadly. Catherine would never make another film. Now back under the care of Dr. Parkin, he along with her mother in the studio moved her to the Alhambra Sanitarium. When she first arrived, she became so manic, she tried to end her life by jumping out of a window, but thankfully staff grabbed her and stopped her. As the weeks went on, she seemed to get better and again was released into her mother's care. But as time went on, she took a turn for the worse yet again. Her mother was now getting older, and she made the decision that Catherine would need to be under complete care, something she could no longer provide for her. She, along with Dr. Parkin and the studio, moved Catherine to the Patton State Hospital in San Bernardino. Catherine's mother held out hope her daughter could win this fight, but as the years passed, that hope faded. On April 2nd, 1937, at the Patton State Hospital, Catherine would pass away. She was only 32 years old. It was found out later that Hal Roach paid for her sanitarium stays and gave an allowance to her mother while Catherine was under her care. Catherine's death certificate lists her cause of death as pulmonary tuberculosis, with dementia praecox psychosis being a contributing factor. Catherine's story is a sad one in a long list of actresses that had struggles in their short lives. Many censored death question why Catherine never got better and why she was in and out of sanitariums. Of course, the starvation diets, the extreme exercising, and the possibility of taking experimental dangerous pills would have done damage to her mind and her body. But if she was under proper treatment, why didn't she get better? Is there a possibility she went without a proper diagnosis of a mental illness? Others question as to what kind of treatment Catherine was subjected to. Were the doctors experimenting on her with psychotics? Was she put through barbaric therapies such as shock treatment? We will never know, as there is no record of what she was subjected to at those institutions. The only ones who can answer that are long dead. Catherine made many audiences laugh, and she was happy for a while. But soon behind the scenes, she would be in pain, not only physically, but mentally. The pressures of the movie industry, with the pressure of being thin to stay on her contract, 
may have destroyed her in the end. She was beautiful, funny, and talented, and sadly maybe she couldn't see that anymore. But thankfully some of her work survives. We can see that talent and hopefully with better preservation methods, her work will be there for future generations to enjoy. <laughs>